Good afternoon. Welcome to the US Webinar 2021. My name is Han and I'll be your host today. Way more than happy to be your host today. Um, before we start, can I quickly check if you can hear me well? Uh, would you please type in the chat box, yes or okay, to let me know that you can hear me well. Perfect. Wonderful, you can see a lot of yeses coming. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, I guess we are good to start. As, as some of you may know, um, the annual VUSD Seoul is an expected event that attracts hundreds of teachers from inside and outside Vietnam to come and share their teaching methods. Um, due to COVID-19, however, it's been very unlikely for us to organize the event offline since last year. But also thanks to COVID-19, this free webinar series has been held to cater an even large number of teachers and created more convenience in terms of location and commuting, especially for faraway and abroad teachers. We're more than happy and brown to make this happen again this year. We hope that with the participation of ELT experts and invited speakers from well-known publishing houses, such as Cambridge Assessment English, Cambridge University Press, eFuture, Macmillan Education, MM Publications, National Ge Geographic Learning, Oxford University Press, StudyCat, and the US, the web meters will provide you with the most updated ELT trains and practical teaching methods and techniques that you can use to teach your class more effectively. But before we start, I'm so glad to announce the winners of the first web webinar lucky draw. Uh, these winners were randomly selected among those who completed the feedback form after the webinar. Let me just show you, um, just share with you the name of those winners, all right? Here we go. Can you all see my screen, my share screen? All right, so congratulations to the five winners. Um, you are awarded with five English for Teaching programs online. Uh, those are Mr. Zhong Lu Phúc Thận, Ms. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Anh, Ms. Lê Nguyễn Ngọc Hà, Ms. Trần Anh Thư, và Ms. Phan Nguyễn Minh. Congratulations again uh, for those of you who are the winner of this. So the US or the sponsor will contact you for the prize receipt. So please check your email regularly. Thank you very much. All right, well, let's get back to our main content today. I won't let you guys wait for any longer. Um, let's join me to welcome Mr. Gary Finistas from eFuture, who is going to deliver an interesting talk about differentiated instruction in the English classroom. How can you do it? Please be informed that we will have the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Also, during that time, I'll send you the links to complete a survey about this webinar and to download your certificate of participation. Now let's start our webinar today. Over to you, Gary. All right, thank you, Han. Hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me okay? How are you all doing this afternoon? Okay, everything sounds great. Good, we have a lot to go through. So um, thank you guys for uh, taking the time out in your afternoon. Hopefully it's not too hot over there in, uh, in Vietnam. So thank you guys for joining. So let's go ahead and let me share my screen here. So I'm going to be presenting about uh, differentiated instruction, okay? Um, has anyone heard of this, uh, this strategy before in the chat? Hopefully this will be something new to you guys and um, be able to kind of learn something and take away from, uh, from this webinar today. And maybe if, even if you can't uh, fully utilize it in your classrooms, um, it's something to kind of think about in how you teach um, in the future. Okay, so I see a lot of uh, this being new to everyone. So uh, yes, but time consuming, Roderick. It's, that's very much um, a thing for the teachers to, to do. So let's get into it here. Okay, so, 
So this is going to be my rough agenda today uh, for everyone. So I'm going to go over for those um, that it is new for, uh, go over what is differentiated instruction and why it can be helpful for your classroom, as well as what can we differentiate in the classroom, okay? And then I'll kind of touch on some learning strategies and then try to take all of the information that I'm giving to you today and trying to apply it um, into a, kind of a model class, essentially. So I'll take some books from eFuture and kind of, um, kind of walk through um, a thought process of what are some things that we can do to you know, help differentiate um, our lessons and our, uh, our, our classes, okay? So the first question here, so what is differentiated instruction? Um, I did see someone write in the chat earlier. So uh, Marvin says to differentiate instructions with regards to starting student learning styles. Okay, so that is a very good, um, good definition there. So the main goal of uh, differentiated instruction is to, like he mentioned, to create opportunities for differences in how individual students learn important content. So how they learn what we're teaching, right? So it's creating those differences and addressing the needs. So we talked about learning styles. So providing multiple pathways through our teaching and through their learning, okay? So I'll kind of be going into what I kind of refer with the learning styles and everything um, with your students, okay? So it's differentiated instruction. So why differentiated instruction? So if you, I want to ask everyone in the chat, um, how many have mixed level students? I'm, I'm expecting a lot of you might have. So like, uh, when I, so a little bit of my background, I was an English teacher in Korea. So a lot of my classes, yeah, were very much mixed level. So uh, unfortunately I learned this kind of strategy later on in my uh, kind of um, professional development. So yeah, so mixed level classes are very difficult and different backgrounds, yeah, exactly. So the backgrounds definitely play a role in um, how well our students learn and their English levels um, going into it. So differentiated instruction, it can be used as a tool to kind of help with these mixed level classes. Uh, upon kind of learning about this, um, learning about this strategy, slowly started integrating it into my classes and you know it really helps um, you know for the teacher to kind of focus in like I've written on here so giving this teacher the opportunity to give the students that need that extra attention those lower level students the attention that they need and then knowing that the students that are higher level can kind of work um, by themselves right so it's just something that benefits all students, whether it's lower level, mid-level, upper level, all at the same time of still being able to challenge them in different ways. Okay. So is it, when I talk about challenges, you know, the lower level students will have different set of challenges than the, uh, the upper level students. Okay. So this is kind of why we go into differentiated instruction. Okay. So Going into thinking about our students, what do we need to, as teachers, think about, okay? So we have a what and a who. So what, of course, we have to think about what we are teaching, right? What we want the students to know, what we want the students to understand, um, not just in the single lesson, but across the whole unit, right? So that's something as teachers, we set the objectives for the students and then figure out from there, how are we going to accomplish these objectives? As well as kind of setting, um, setting the opportunities to get some deeper understanding of the, uh, of the subject, right? And then the who, so focusing in on the students. So the students are you know, the focal point of, of teaching, of course. And just realizing as with people, people in real life that we encounter, People are just complex, right? So, and not all people are the same. And that goes the same as with our students and how they learn, all right? So students are very complex and they all learn differently, right? So we have to kind of, as teachers, figure out, it's like a puzzle, right? Figure out and identify 
the learning styles of kind of the students? And then how can we kind of, uh, how can we cater to their learning styles, okay? So now going into what we can differentiate. So I'm talking about what can we cater to the students? How are we going to get through to them, okay? So there are kind of four things here that I'm going to talk about on how we can differentiate. So that's the content, it's the process, the product, and the learning environment, all right? Okay, so um, just looked at the chat briefly. So the, yeah, so the presentation will be made available um, soon. Via Stessa will make it available. So if anyone has that kind of uh, idea later, question. Okay, so going over the first one, we have content. So content, of course, is what we are teaching to the students. So what we are teaching. So when we think about differentiating the content, we have to think about designing the activities um, for the students that cover, you know, various challenges, different levels. Um, if you're looking to have some sort of structure um, on how to, you know, differentiate your activities, you can follow what is called Bloom's taxonomy. Okay. So for those that uh, maybe a bit of review for, for some of us teachers here of what Bloom's taxonomy is, um, we have this kind of pyramid here. So we're starting from like the lower level and then kind of moving up. Okay. So these are kind of the objectives that we're going to set for the students, um, for the students in, in the activities that we're going to design, okay? So starting from the bottom would be the more simple, simple activities, remembering and understanding um, certain, you know, activities and content that you're doing. And then moving into the more challenging stuff of applying it, analyzing, evaluating, and then um, at the top, creating, uh, based off of the, uh, the content, okay? So that's Bloom's taxonomy. So some examples of, um, so an example activities. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention at the beginning with differentiated instruction, um, it's, it's something that can be done no matter the kind of school level, okay? So today I'm going to be focusing on the primary level, elementary level. Um, but, you know, this is something that you can easily do with middle school level students all the way up to adults. Um, and I'll talk about, I'll try to refer to some things, um, how you can um, adapt it for those. Um, and just a quick question to the chat on that point. Um, how many or what age range or grade levels are you teaching? Just so I have a good idea of, um, of my audience before I move forward here. Um, are you teaching kind of adults? Are you teaching elementary? Six to nine, nine to 14 adults. Okay, middle school, university, mostly teens, undergraduate students. Okay, so we have a white. So just like with mixed level, mixed level uh, students, I have mixed level teachers here. Okay, so I, I have to kind of, uh, kind of give as many examples as I can and think of um, off the top. Right, so um, yeah, so a lot of these, um, although that I might give examples for the kind of primary level students, um, all you teachers that are teaching secondary and above, you can easily think of what you're teaching to your students and obviously you can uh, adapt the activities and the, uh, and the activities and projects and stuff that I'll be going over for their level. Okay, so don't just think, oh, I'm talking about mostly primary, that this only works for primary. So you can easily, easily uh, adapt this to your students' levels, okay? So like, for example, here, this first one, match vocabulary words to definitions. So uh, throwing it to you guys, uh, so we have this kind of activity here. So matching vocabulary words to definitions. For a, uh, for a secondary level, uh, a secondary level uh, example, how would you be able to, you know, adapt this to a, a secondary level? Something simple as matching vocabularies to definitions that would challenge and challenge them. So like on a primary level, we would have the students maybe match a picture with the word. So that could be one thing. So, so they, you know, the students have that, you know, in their native language, they have the definition in their mind but you know you get the uh you can just you know match the word in picture for simple 
using a sentence, right? Uh, I think some synonyms, good. So the upper levels, you know, match, match the vocabulary word with its synonym, perfect. So those are different things. Yeah? And then going into reading a passage of text and answer related questions, okay? So easily something that you can adapt. Um, easily something that you can adapt to all levels. And depending, you know, of course, you would differentiate the, the uh, questions and possibly even the text, which I'll, I'll be talking about, okay? So I'm going through here. I won't go through everything point by point, but you can see where I'm kind of going with, um, with these uh, different examples here. So that's the content, okay? So this is how, what we're, we're teaching, okay? So some things to keep in mind, again, um, some of this is kind of primarily focused on the primary level. So being identified, being able to identify the key vocabulary through various means. So, you know, not just having the students write down the words um, in the, like in primary, in uh, the primary level, something like a word wall, right? Having that, um, you know, having the words that they're going to be learning more visible around the classroom. So, you know, it gives them that practice. Um, I know that that works for you know anyone that's learning a second language. I I do that myself uh, when I learn a second language. Um, you can probably see if you saw my desk, I have like post-it notes of new Korean words that I've learned, um, and just kind of you know that's a way to review. I see it, and you kind of reiterating it. So with our students, they see it around the classroom. Hopefully, you're not telling them to write on their desks or anything, but you can see it around the classroom. That, they can, you know, they look at it, be more familiarized with it and all that. Um, using a variety of visuals. So this is instead of, you know, introducing the words, you know, listen and repeat and just saying it to the students using visuals like, you know, showing flashcard. Oh, oh yeah, with the background, you might not be able to see, but I have a flashcard. So showing the flashcards to the students, um, showing them the real objects uh, in, in the classroom. So it's something to be able to connect them. So uh, that goes with the last point here of activating the student's background knowledge. So being able to tie what the content is to what the students possibly already know, right? So these are a lot of things that we can kind of think about as we're planning and as we are uh, going through and teaching the, uh, the content, all right? Okay, so that's the content. Just check my time, okay. And then we have the process. So this is how we are teaching, okay? So the content is what we are teaching and now the process is how we are teaching. So this again goes through talking about the, um, the learning styles of the students and then how we cater to that, right? So how can we help um, with the students? Um, as a teacher, you know, we should try, as I have on my second note here, to kind of vary the way that we teach. It not only helps the students with different styles, but it also keeps your class interesting at the same time, right? So if you always come in, always do the same, like maybe have the same introduction song all the, all the time, or you know, you, even just the, the intonation in your voice can be, um, can be very helpful and just keeping the students engaged in the class, right? Oh, thank you, Philip, for um, the comment in the chat. Uh, for those that don't know the word realia, realia means the real objects, right? Okay. And then, um, yeah, with these uh, various styles of teaching, just realize that we're not, we're not focusing on one for the most part. I don't want you to get the wrong idea of that um, as I go through each learning style in a second that uh, when I talk about various styles, I don't mean just focus in on, you know, the uh, auditory learners or the kinesthetic learners. Different styles, you know, with different activities, you can cater to the various styles, all right? And the final note here before moving on to the learning styles and going over those, uh, differentiation doesn't mean individualization, right? So I don't mean for you to necessarily um, create individual lesson plans for each of your students, right? That's way too much work as a teacher, especially uh, depending on your situation, right? You don't want, like for me, uh, when I taught English in, in Korea, I had, my first year of teaching, I had eight classes of students with 
upwards of 25 to 27 students per class. And you can, that's already almost, yeah, maybe upwards of two, over 250 students um, to kind of plan around, right? So I don't mean for you to kind of do that. So I just wanna make sure that you understand that. So going over the, uh, the learning styles. Okay, so, so we have first, so I just wanna go over these, uh, these learning styles with you. So we have first the auditory learners, okay? So these are the students that, you know, are easy, easily learned through kind of listening, right? So songs, recordings, um, and they have to kind of focus in on what they're hearing a bit, okay? So these are the kind of auditory learners. On the visual learners, the ones that have to see it, you know, these are the ones that need the images, right? So instead of just showing the word to the student, you know, of course, you'll have an image to kind of, like I talked about earlier, connect the word to the actual object, right? Gives them that, okay? Color codes, so for those that are maybe teaching grammar, uh, so for the upper level um, teachers in here, so using color codes, um, putting the, the verbs one color, the pronouns another color, you know, and then you know, verb tenses can be a separate color. So, um, just seeing, being able for someone to distinguish between the different grammar structures is a way to, uh, to do that, right? Okay. Then we have the verbal learners. Okay. So this is someone that uh, needs to, you know, kind of use the language essentially, needs to speak it and wants to share and kind of, uh, yeah, talk a lot and essentially the verbal learners kind of self-explanatory there, right? Logic and math. Um, so the logical learners, it's hard to go through with these with the, in the English classroom. Um, uh, the things that I can think of off the head again is going towards grammar because they need to, you know, understand the logistics of, you know, creating a sentence in another language, right? So, you know, categorizing all the verbs in one section, all the pronouns in another section kind of deal there, okay? And you can do, again, you can do this simply you know, on the lower level, if you're, say, you're reviewing um, previous vocabulary, animals, colors, and all that, you can still kind of categorize through that as well. Kinesthetics, these are the ones that need to move. Um, TPR activities, um, you know, with a lot of the song and chants that uh, are available in a lot of the books, um, there's a lot of action that goes along with each of them. So, you know, especially if they're learning, you know, verbs or uh, activities and stuff, using their body to kind of, you know, bridge that gap of, uh, to learn the, uh, learn the content, okay? So just a few more, social and interpersonal. So these are the ones, uh, ah, TPR, good question. TPR activity means uh, total physical response, okay? So it's just anything moving, getting them to use their body and move around. So they, uh, yeah, just actions, essentially. Yeah, good question, thank you. Uh, social interpersonal, so these are the students, you know, <clears throat> that like to, uh, you know, be social, be go work in groups, they don't tend to work alone, um, you know, role-playing activities, projects, and all that um, will be very effective for them. And then the solitary, so the, the opposite of the social, you know, you get those, um, you get those uh, students that, you know, the quiet ones, they tend to kind of uh, sit aside and rather just work alone. Um, I've had some students like that, and this is where, you know, you can go up to them, you know, if we differentiate with all this, you know, if the student wants to work alone, that's okay. But um, in some things I'll talk about later, we, you know, hopefully we can try to integrate them as well um, through all of it. Okay, so some examples, um, providing textbooks or you know, images for the students, a simple one for the visual, auditory learners, audiobooks, using the, um, the files, and uh, give kinesthetic learners the opportunity to you know, complete, especially um, right now with teaching online, um, you know, interactive assignments and everything. Okay? So I'm giving them the opportunity to, uh, to do that. Okay. So just a reminder again, students, 
uh, probably won't just be one of these styles. There'll be some kind of combination, right? So uh, just remember that, like I, I briefly went over it earlier, I'm kind of reiterating myself a bit, that um, we're not trying to zero in on one style for each activity, right? So if one student is, you know, is a visual learner or a kinesthetic learner, but also a social one, you can put them all together for you can think of activities um, to go along to, uh, to satisfy those different learning styles, okay? And then the product, okay? So we went through what we are teaching, how we are teaching, and then now we're focusing on what the students are producing, right? How are the students going to show um, the mastery of the content, okay? So some things here, um, again, I kind of have some good um, examples here that, uh, that kind of go across um, multiple levels here that you can think about. Um, you know, reading and writing book reports if the students want book reports, um, using graphic organizers, having charts, you know, um, idea webs, all of that. Um, auditory learners, you know, giving the uh, oral reports, um, kinesthetic, you know, giving them something to use their hands. So like building a diorama. Um, if you don't know what a diorama is, it's kind of a roughly, it would be like a, it could be either like 2D or 3D basically um, a project of making a, uh, making a scene from the content or, or something like that, right? Pop-ups, good, yeah, as well. Just creating a model. Yeah, origami could be, uh, could be used as well in, uh, to illustrate the content, okay? So that is the uh, kind of the, the production, the product of the students, okay? All right. Yeah, let me just double check. Okay, okay. And then the fourth thing here that we can differentiate, we have the learning environment. Okay. So, uh, you know, this can roughly from being flexible with the classroom layout. Um, talk about uh, some of the things that you can do with it. Um, if you've heard of uh, station, station learning, um, talking about, you know, flexible classroom layouts. Something you can do with, uh, with differentiated learning is how to set up different stations. So if you have certain desks, you can, depending on how many you have, you can set up a certain number of desks um, in a group and set a station up. And each of those stations will have different objectives for the students. And you would put the students in groups and uh, you know, have a time limit and they can kind of go around and uh, can go around and um, basically uh, do the tasks, right? Um, in an online setting, if you're using Zoom, uh, and if you're using Zoom in an online setting, they have the breakout rooms, uh, then uh, you can kind of, uh, as a teacher, kind of pop through and uh, give them different, uh, different objectives as they, they go through. So, so yeah, arranging again for additional support and group work, and then effective classroom management techniques. Okay, so we'll kind of go deeper into that, All right? So examples, again, that's already talked about some examples, breaking the students into reading groups. So if you wanna practice the reading, you can put them into the various levels. Um, again, if the student wants to read by themselves, you can have them read by themselves and then just making sure that they have their own kind of space, right? Yeah, and it's not, not easy in a public school, right? If you get, to, uh, to do all of this, but that's why uh, earlier we talked about how it's, uh, it's a lot of work <laughs> to go into this. But once you, once you get the hang of it, and once you are able to apply it and understand it, then uh, it's a, it kind of uh, works well with the students, okay? All right, and then going into some learning strategies. So these aren't the only learning strategies um, that I'll be going over, um, but... Uh, Going to just talk about three here. So meta metacognitive, cognitive, and social effective. Um, social effective, we'll probably go into a little bit of the, uh, the environment, the learning environment uh, differentiation. Yeah, social active, okay. So these methods here, so metacognitive is just getting the students to understand what they're learning and uh, how they're learning. So just previewing the main ideas and concepts 
Um, if they have speaking or writing tasks, giving them the time to plan ahead and then kind of self-manage and self-evaluate themselves a bit. Um, of course, depending on the level, of course, the self-management, self-evaluation might be for those uh, higher level. You can't really expect the students to be capable of self-evaluating. Um, you might be able to peer evaluate um, with the students as well. Um, so that's something that uh, they can do. So for metacognitive strategies, uh, cognitive strategies um, is the kind of process um, the students for the students to understand what they're learning. So improving, you know, their understanding a bit more uh, and how they apply it to, you know, um, to their production, to the, the product phase, right? So can they put what they're learning into context? Okay. Can they uh, create a conversation or a role play or you know, some kind of pro project and with the proper context? And then imagery as well. Can they, you know, take what we're learning and uh, build the, the proper image for the uh, corresponding uh, content? And then comes something as simple as summarizing. So this is kind of the, the comprehension, right? Okay. And then the social effective strategies. So this is more of looking at the student and the class in general. So um, when I talked about classroom management. Um, and this deals with the emotions and attitudes um, that affect the students. So thinking about the uh, seating charts, well, you know, if one student doesn't get along with another student and uh, trying to maximize the, uh, maximize the kind of, uh, maximize, yeah, to kind of enable the students to um, learn uh, optimally. I think optimal is what I uh, was looking for, not maximize. Okay, so looking at the cooperation and then as well as encouraging the students to question for clarification, right? So uh, making sure that they're not afraid to ask questions. A lot of times, you know, when, when I taught as well, um, the students would be afraid to raise their hand, right? So I would, you know, I'd be teaching the content and then... Uh, Afterwards, you know, I'd ask the, the general question of the class, does everyone have any questions? You understand, but uh, no one would, they wouldn't say anything. But then when I would, you know, let them go and work by themselves, I would walk around and talk with the students. The student would, you know, come up to me or tap me on my arm or something. And they would ask me a question because, you know, uh, they would, again, clear, I would have to re-clarify for the students um, that didn't understand. and. Just trying to build that environment where, you know, making them feel safe that they're not going to be kind of ridiculed or anything for asking a question, right? So uh, kind of, kind of uh, encouraging, encouraging questioning, right? So those are the kind of different learning strategies that we can uh, kind of go around with. Okay. Yeah, not be judged all the time, right? So going off of that, just a kind of side point with that comment. Um, I had as not uh, talking about a lot of kind of things for the uh, that I can apply back from my my teaching days is um, whether they're a lower level student or an upper level student, students are you know they're afraid to be judged. So kind of cultivating that environment and making sure that whether they're good at English or not, they feel safe in the class because you know I've had students that were really good at English. You know, they were, they, I, they could have a, almost a fluent conversation with me, but they wouldn't speak in class because they didn't like the attention that those other students would give them or the, the kind of side comments that, that would happen. So they would, became very timid right away. Okay? So yeah, as teachers, that's just, you know, one, another thing that we kind of have to look, look after, right? Okay, so, or maybe there's not much engaging activities, right? <laughs> so that's on the teacher as well, that we have to kind of make sure that we can make it as engaging as possible. And with, you know, with the, the comment on uh, engaging activities, um, engagement, if a student isn't as engaged in class or with the activity, more than likely it means that they're not being challenged enough as well. So, uh, yeah. Okay, good. 
So let's go into the application. So how much time do I have left? So I've got about a good 20 minutes or so. So now with the applications, I'm going to take, um, take some books from eFuture and then kind of together collectively, I'm gonna to try to ask you guys for your ideas because there's been some great, uh, great comments and everything in the chat that I've been, you know, I've been monitoring the chat. And uh, hopefully as well, um, to make sure that your chat settings are set to, so that it sends to everyone. Um, sometimes the, the comments that you guys make or that I'm referring to are only sent to me. So uh, you guys have all great, um, great things to add to this. So um, yeah. So with these applications, we're just going over some different lessons, projects, and assessment as well. How we can, um, this assessment I probably could have touched on as well um, with the production but what we can do to, uh, to uh, apply differentiation to assessment, okay? Yeah, so if you do have questions, I do see them, but uh, we will have time at the end. So if you can use the Q&A box in Zoom, um, I will get to those questions towards the end, okay? So applications. So again, just more, a little bit more reiteration and kind of stressing that um, differentiating works for anything. It's all about how you do it, right? So no matter what the content you're, you're using, like I talked about differentiating for you know, wide levels, um, it's all how you do it and how you adapt it for your students, okay? So like I talked about and referred to, uh, we will kind of be focusing on primary, but I will be uh, making some comments over on how you can do for, uh, for secondary as well, since there's quite a bit of you that have the uh, secondary level students. So these are our three course books that we have at eFuture, the primary level, and they're all very differently, right? So the content is already going to be different. So whether you have a simple course book and that's straightforward, or you have kind of the 21st century learning um, content and CLIL and all that, um, there's different ways that you can go about uh, differentiating the, uh, the lessons and activities. Okay, so here we're gonna take a first one from hand in hand. So our topic here is colors, right? So we're gonna take these two uh, first pages, the introduction to the units. So this is the students are just being introduced to the language, what they're going to be learning and mostly just listening and a bit of speaking practice, right? So, so we're going, go, going to go through the kind of three things that I talked about, or three main things that we can differentiate. So first one being the process and content, right? So how going over, so we, I've talked about how to differentiate and what we can differentiate in a lot of examples. So now we have a book. So this is what we are teaching, right? So what are some ways, if you can tell me in the chat, um, how, what are some ways that we can differentiate the, the content, so the activities? How can we differentiate the, the activities in the book? And or how can we differentiate the process? So how we, how we present, present um, this content to the students? Present the colors first, okay? So, so Philip, are you talking about student match names to colors, okay? So being introduced. So let's so I'm giving them the, the matching. Follow the lesson plan in the book. Very good. Hopefully, you know, teachers have the uh, have the lesson plans, have the uh, teachers' manuals. You know, those are very helpful. So looking at the processing on. So reorder the lines. Good. So some of these might be going into the um, product as well. So um, we might come back to those when we talk about uh, differentiating the product. So use real things, good. So, so let's go back. So on the top we had present the colors first. So what Philip says, well, presenting the colors first, um, what I used to do in my class, pre-teach, right? Pre-teach the content a bit, okay? Pre-teaching the, pre the content. So before we get into kind of the conversation, the main conversation in the story or in the book, the students kind of have the idea already of what the words are because you know sometimes you know the students can't they, they don't know the words already you know activating the background knowledge okay so using the pictures to present perfect good using the the realia 
Ask them questions about the photos. Good picture walk. Yeah, so a lot of things. So that's that's a good way to uh, activate the students' background knowledge. Find objects in the class with these colors. Great, it's a great one. Ask students what to think. What would happen next? Great prediction. Predicting what will happen next. Ask this. Assess the students if they know all the kinds of colors. Good. So that's a good kind of warm up activity. Um, there's one, so uh, I didn't put it in my slide, so I'm gonna say this verbally with, with that, uh, Rebeth, what Rebeth said. Um, there's an activity that you can do called think, pair, share, okay? And that's a good way to help differentiate and kind of, um, kind of, uh, kind of cater to different learning styles. Um, I will add um, the slide or a slide talking about think pair share into this. Um, so when you when you all receive it later, there will be something uh, on that. Um, so for think pair share, it's giving the students something to look at. So example here, um, if they looked at the picture or if you gave them a list of colors, right? So the think part of it is giving the students the time to um, to fill in the words that they already know, right? Or if you could just have a blank table of, okay, these are the colors I know, and they start writing them down. So you give them, say, one minute, right? And then the second part is pair. So now you put the students together with another student or pair them up, of course, and then you'd give them another minute, right? And give them another minute to think together now. So now they're with a partner, they're not by themselves. They can think together and compare what they already know, what they wrote down. So this gives them that kind of opportunity to, um, yeah, think, pair, share. Did I say something else? Did I say think, pair, pair? <laughs> yeah, so I see some people, yeah. So you give them another minute to work in pairs. And at the end, in the share part, they all come together as a class, right? So you'd all come together as a class, and then they would talk about the different colors that each you know person or pair had talked about. So that's one way to kind of, you know, that's many uh, ways to kind of differentiate. And there's many different ways to even do a think pair share, right? So if you just gave them, for one example, if you gave them one paper and they just started writing down the colors, that's one way to do it. Another way is to, um, what I thought of is, uh, so I, you know, my students were Korean, of course. So I made a table of colors, but the, I gave it to them in Korean. So they had a bunch of, one call, the first column had a lot of Korean, um, had the colors in the, in the Korean language. And I would give the students one minute by themselves and they had to write in the English words in the second column. So they're trying to work in, fill in the, uh, fill in the box. And then of course, then you know, after that minute, then they work in pairs and then go over the answers um, as a class. So you can do something simple like that um, for uh, you know, any, any subject, right? And that's just kind of the, uh, the simple way to do it, okay? So going back, so process and content, there was a lot of great answers. Can't go through all of them. Okay, I see someone was asking for the term. Okay, so processing and the content. So some other ones, so fill in the blanks. You know, listen and fill in the blanks. So what you can do, um, depending on you know the students, you can give them the different levels essentially. Um, if the students want to just listen to the audio and not see the video, or the other group can listen to both the audio and the video as they're working. And then uh, what you guys have already said, questions. Questions about the conversation, questions about the pictures. And then you can tier the questions as well, okay? So some questions, like we talked about, some might be easier for the students and some might be more difficult. So it's all about, uh, all about um, what's it called? all about challenging the students in different ways, right? Listen and colors for them from the audio, perfect. If the students have like cards, right? Color cards, oh, this would go more into the product, but yeah, so some other things for the product, so that I've thought of. So the students can create their own version of the story. So they can keep, they can keep the, um, the same dialogue, but then, you know, give them the kind of, artistic freedom and they can create their own images and uh, drawings to, to go with the uh, dialogue. 
Um, going into the second part here for the lyrics, the students can change the lyrics okay, if they want to create their own song. And then the role play, okay, so giving them the opportunity to group role play or just partner role play um, is a good thing. And uh, with differentiation, like I'll talk about, um, a lot of it is giving the students the choice, right? It's all about student choice. So that is a big factor into uh, differentiation, okay? So that's the product here. And then now we're going into the next pages here. So words and grammar. So they're looking at the sentences, introducing or reviewing the, uh, the colors again with the students and then a little bit of speaking uh, practice. So looking at the process again, like I talked about using realia, using real images, and then some games and activities, right? Someone said Pictionary earlier, right? So you can have the students do a Pictionary um, activity. You can do it through Zoom if you don't already know. If you are teaching online, um, there is the kind of uh, drawing function and the whiteboard that you can do um, when you screen share. Let's see, I don't have time. Okay, I won't have to, I was going to try to do a round with you guys, uh, but running out of time for me to uh, do a Pictionary round with you. But you can share like a whiteboard and then draw. Um, different group games that you can do with the students and then a memory game as well. Kind of, you know, match the picture or match the color with the word and all that. Okay, a little bit quicker. I wanna get to your guys' questions as well. So going through the products, okay. So different projects. So we have a rainbow here. So the students can, you know, be creative, create their own rainbow, and then talk about the colors on the rainbows and what order. Um, they can make a few sentences and draw um, something that has their favorite color. And then, or just doing like a list, you know, organizing the colors from least to most liked. Okay, some kind of simple activities. Okay. So then we're going into a few more examples here. So now we have a different topic. So there's different activities. So the topic is, what's she going to do this weekend? So this is from our um, Smart English course book. So what, how can we differentiate this? Uh, what products uh, for this topic? So some project ideas I thought of, a weekly planner. You know, the students are writing about themselves, what they do their week. Um, and all that. This also gives the opportunity for the students to kind of extend their learning a bit if they want to know, um, know something that's not in the book as well. Their plan a vacation, their dream vacation, what activities will they do on their vacation, what will they do, all that. And then kind of write a story about one of these so they can give them the, the option to pick one of these things and then write a short story about it, right? So those are some things that you can do. Or you can give, you know, you can have the students, present the students with all three of these project ideas and just have them pick, right? Pick one. So here's some examples. So if I, for example, picked eat out at a restaurant, so a restaurant project, uh, these are some examples that I found. So you can um, have the students write about their restaurant, create a menu, right? Well, you'll what they you know give like an advertisement pitch. Okay, so this is an example I found. And then uh, for online interactive stuff, um, there's a lot of websites that students can use for uh, for these projects. So one example here I've used is uh, is Canva. So I just made a simple simple menu, and then I could present it to you guys and talk about it. So like here, so my favorite foods. So one dollar tacos. I'm from. California, and California has a lot of Mexican food, and I love it very much and miss it a lot. And the tacos were very cheap, so $1 tacos, Taco Tuesdays for all of you. And then some of my favorite kinds of tacos, you know, fish. Um, does anyone know carnitas? Or carnitas is like shredded, uh, shredded pork, you know, shrimp and carne asada. Korean fried chicken, you know, I live in Korea. Korean fried chicken is, you know, one of the most delicious things. It's the, the new meaning of KFC to me, not, uh, not the uh, restaurant chain now. And then some other things, you know, see that, that way the you know, students can present it, uh, present their project this way as well. And if they don't, again, giving the students choice, differentiation, if the students want to do it in a pair or in a group, 
they can do that as well, right? So you can easily do it uh, to, for the students on how they wanna do it. And um, with the student choice, I'll briefly just talk about it. it's It's all about giving students their own, like the ownership of their learning. If the students are more inclined to be able to choose how they're learning or how they get to do the assignments, they have a, there's more chance of them being motivated to do it, right? So that's kind of uh, the reasoning behind the uh, student choice. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Okay. So then now going into some specific things within the English classroom. So kind of looking at the different skills, right? So speaking and listening. Um, so how can we differentiate specifically for some speaking or listening uh, activities? Um, like I talked about information gaps. Um, there's a lot of games that you can do. Uh, speed up a little bit. There's a lot of games that you can do for information gaps, not just a simple listen and fill in. Um, you can have the students, um, you know, give the students a kind of, it's hard to do just for speaking. Of course, other uh, other skills will go be involved, but um, having a kind of relay a bit. So the students have a sheet of paper that has the, the sentences. One student has to read the sentences to the other student. That student listens. And then another student runs across and then um, runs across and tells another student and that student writes. So that kind of uh, activity kind of, uh, kind of uh, fulfills all four. Um, I saw a question here about taboo. Uh, taboo is basically it can be used as like a vocabulary um, a vocabulary review pra or practice. So you give the students one word, okay? So one student will come up and they will get a card, right? They'll get a card that has a word on top, but then there's also going to be a list of words that the student can't say to describe the words, right? So they, they have a list of words that they, they can't use to describe. So example, um, let's go with tacos. So maybe some words that I'm not allowed to say would be Mexican. You can't say Mexican. You can't say Mexico, anything associated with Mexico where you can't say, um, yeah. So you would have to think of different ways to describe the word so the students can, um, can read it or can guess it to the student. Okay, uh, 21 questions is kind of similar. Um, you can pick a word. So like I can think of a word and then the class has to ask that person questions to try to figure out what is it that they picked, right? So again, if I pick tacos, you know, maybe the first question um, be, uh, is it a person? No, and you keep going like that until you, you kind of narrow it down until they figure out what the word is that the student picked, okay? So those are some of the games. Bingo, you guys should know. Who am I is kind of similar um, to 21 questions, but it's more focused on people. You can kind of do that as a for fun activity. Um, or if you're learning about jobs, um, for those that are teaching the adults, you can obviously you have more freedom of, uh, of being able to do that. Okay, so yeah, bamboozle, yeah, actions, yeah, yeah, actions, that's your kinesthetic learners. So yeah, for taboo, you can allow actions, okay? So then there's role play and then obviously intonation practice as well. Uh, going into some reading, um, some activities that you can do with reading. So speed reading, um, this would be mainly focusing on fluency. So just making sure you can time the students, um, time the students on how quickly they can read the full dialogue, um, making sure, of course, that they're, uh, they're, they're pron pronouncing correctly, okay? Predicting yeah, and, and retelling as well. And then differentiating in tier, tiered assignments. So I kind of talked about this earlier. So one student can do a book report, another student can do storyboard, and another student can do an alternative story. So it's just giving different different options. Some might be easier for one, others might wanna challenge themselves a bit more. Um, it might take a bit of encouragement to get the students to um, pick the, the higher tier, but also it's, it's not like a deduction or anything if they, if they don't do the higher tier. And then I talked about this briefly earlier with grouped reading. 
okay? And then using visuals with reading, which we, we've talked about as well, okay? And then writing, so here, so this, um, this from Let's Smile, um, the previous uh, three pages have been from uh, Let's Smile. Uh, so we have uh, different jobs. So we are talking about jobs here. So if we have writing, you can have them uh, talk about all that, okay? All right, so yeah, it's just these last points here with, with, uh, with writing. Again, you can do it in groups, different styles, let students choose the theme and all that, okay? All right, and the final note with assessment, um, just like I talked about before, just giving the students the choice, um, specifically with uh, speaking tests and all that, giving them different options to be assessed. So if they, so if you're on the primary level, if you're just doing question answer with one-on-one, -on -one, maybe you can allow the students to be assessed through partnered role play or group role play. So that's kind of what I'm going for with that. Just being flexible and with all these different uh, ideas here, okay? All right, so I kind of went through those last bits. We do have five minutes for some Q&A. Okay, so I'm going to look through the Q&A box here and try to try to get uh, through as many questions as possible, okay? Kinesthetic learning. So here, I'm confused between kinesthetic learning and TPR. Oh, so kinesthetic learning, uh, Alex, um, to help with kinesthetic learning, TPR is the kind of activities to help them learn kinesthetically. So the, um, the uh, example that I had talked about earlier, let's say for, for the younger students that are learning, say, activities. So we had something called activities or the activities earlier. Um, giving them actions to go along with um, the vocabulary would be a way that um, kind of TPR could be mixed in for those kinesthetic learners or kinesthetic, or wait, TPR, kinesthetic, right? And am I going off the right thing there or might have gotten confused because of TPR, kinesthetic. So something just kinesthetic, oh gosh, you might've confused me a little bit with the, word, with the wording as well. Now I'm confused. But yeah, TPR is basically with the actions. Kinesthetic, I think actually, as I was talking about it, might be the students that need to use their hands and actually use um, the uh, kind of with the projects and everything. So like I talked about, it could go together. Like the, they can overlap the learning styles. There's not gonna be a student that has just one um, learning style, okay? Um, see, so what kind of tests can we do to identify students' learning styles? Um, since most likely we're not going to know, you know, as teachers, when we have that first class, we're not going to know right away unless their previous teacher might have taken notes on them. But if it's a clean slate and we don't have that, the best way I can think of is, you know, again, varying how you teach and using a variety of different activities. And you keep notes on what the students react to or not. I think that would be the best way to uh, identify the learning styles, right? Did the student enjoy, <clears throat> enjoy doing the projects, the hands-on projects? Um, was this other student not participating in some, you know, moving activities that involved some movement in the class? Um, even TPR, that talk, and I talked about kind of the relay race, the speaking relay race, that even though it's not um, directly uh, related to the, um, to the things, it gets the students moving and more, uh, and more, engaged in the class, okay? So there's quite a few questions here about um, identifying the learning styles. So it's just making sure that, um, <clears throat> making sure that uh, you're making a variety of different activities that can give you the idea and the hints at what type of learning styles your students have, okay? That makes sense? That was an anonymous uh, question. So hopefully that helped. Um, as well, and Tan Tran as well, you uh, do we need to pay attention to each learning style. Um, individually, each learning style, no, you can, again, like I talked about, a lot of the activities and um, the ways that you do things can, can adhere to a variety of different learning styles. So I don't want you to focus in on just, okay, today is the kinesthetic learners, today is just the verbal learners. 
it's going to kind of do it on uh, different ones. Okay. Let me see how much we got. Okay, I've got a few more questions. Uh, how do we motivate them? Oh, that's a very different, difficult question, how to motivate the students. Um, it all comes into, again, learning more about the students, uh, getting them more involved in class and engaged, uh, figuring out their interests in addition to their learning styles. So um, there's, there's a lot of things. It's a, I can, that's a, probably a, its own separate webinar about motivating, uh, motivating the students. Should we do to motive? Yeah, and there's another question on motivation as well. Do you need to take one time all the levels? I'm not saying that one. Uh, with Bloom's taxonomy, I would do it over time. Um, or you give the students the choice as well. So talking about tiered activities, um, some students won't be able to do the you know, evaluation, evaluate or create they can only do the uh, understand and uh, remember part. So you can do different tiers of the Bloom's taxonomy and different activities for the students to do. Um, I wouldn't try to fit it all in one lesson. That's um, over, uh, it's over exerting yourself as a teacher. Okay. Online TPR activities. Oof. Yeah, so you can, if you're gonna do actions and all that, you can, have the students with their camera on and try to do it that way. It would be very difficult, but uh, there are ways. Um, now there's a reading game that I've done before where you can put symbols. You can give the students a text to read and you give symbols. And uh, the students have to do an action while reading. So that would be a, one way to do it. Okay. All right. Okay. So I think I'm a bit over time. Here, so there's a lot of great questions. I wish I could get to all of them. Um, yeah, so hopefully, I'm sorry if I couldn't get to all your questions. Yeah, there, you guys are great. Uh, my email is here on the screen as well. Um, so if you if you want to send me your questions um, through my email as well, I can try to answer them the best that I can. And uh, Ms. Han, if there's anything um, I would need to do to wrap it up and yeah, thank you guys. Just want to thank you all for uh, yeah, listening and spending the time, to, um, you know, coming into the webinar. Hopefully, uh, I was able to give you some ideas. Um, I mostly tried to do this as a jumping off point for you guys to kind of plant the seed a little bit um, into, into you as a teacher to give you uh, different ways to uh, get to your students. Because I know, you know, mixed level classrooms and being able to help your students is not easy, especially nowadays. So uh, thank you guys again uh, so much. And uh, so, yeah. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary, very much for your um, presentation. And thank you, everybody. Uh, we hope that you enjoy our webinar today and will be able to apply the ideas to your teaching practice. VUS, your English, your future.